Uh, good morning, members. Uh, welcome to this hybrid meeting of the Environment, Regeneration and Street Scene Scrutiny Committee on the 20th of October 2022. Um, I'm Councillor Sean Percy and I'll be chairing uh, this meeting today. Uh, please ensure your phones are switched to silent uh, during the meeting and please mute your microphones when you're not speaking so that we don't have um, any feedback, please. Um, if you do want to speak, please raise your hand in the chamber or your electronic hand if you're joining us on Teams. So in terms of today's agenda, I just need to just make a brief announcement on the scrutiny agenda in terms of the order we're taking the items. Um, we're going to run through de declarations of interest, minutes of the previous meeting, pre-decision scrutiny and then action log. Um, there's um, uh, in error that there's been um, an item included about going into private session, which isn't necessary. So it's just for clarity for members, the order we're going to run through. Um, so um, today, scrutiny committee members have decided to scrutinise items six and 12 on the cabinet uh, board agenda. We have decided not to scrutinise item five um, as it relates only to the traffic regulation orders for the 20 mile an hour limit. Um, proposals. However, following um, the seminar members had yesterday, I would like to make a few comments on behalf of the committee uh, that members wished um, to express uh, publicly and have uh, put on record. Um, and that was around concerns for the 20 mile hour scheme as a whole in terms of allocation of funding, uh, both to deliver the scheme initially and for ongoing maintenance of assets such as new highway signage. Um, we're aware officers are having discussions with Welsh Government around the cost involved at the moment to deliver the scheme to ensure it doesn't have an adverse impact on the Council's uh, current highways budget. Um, and in addition to this as well, that there are some concerns around the extent um, to which South Wales Police will be able to enforce the scheme. So I just want to make those comments um, on behalf of the committee um, in this sort of public session um, as they were expressed um, yesterday during our seminar. So in relation to item five as well, there is a minor correction to the report that needs to be made. So I'm just going to bring in uh, the officer, Dave Griffiths, just to explain that um, before we move on to our scrutiny items. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair, um, and apologies really to members. Um, if you look at page six of that um, report under the integrated impact assessment, there is reference in the third paragraph um, which is an error within the report, um, which must have been um, a, a paragraph that must have been uh, picked up by one of our uh, traffic engineers and inserted by error, where it says, and provide disabled parking outside the new development. That's an error within the report which needs to be struck out. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you for that um, clarification. So I'll now move on to um, item two on the agenda, which is declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest from members? I don't see any, Chair. Excellent, thank you. As usual, if members uh, do wish to declare an interest doing an item, please just raise your hand and let us know. Um, that's absolutely fine and we'll deal with that then. Um, so I'm now going to move on to minutes of the previous meeting, which is agenda item uh, three, and I just need um, a proposal and a second uh, to agree that the minutes from the previous meeting are an accurate, accurate record of that meeting. So can I have a move and a second of that, please? I propose, Chair. Thank, thank you, Ros. Second, Chair. And seconded by Councillor Carpenter. And if there's no, no objections to that, I'll assume those minutes approved as a true and accurate record. Thank you. So I'm now going to move on to the cabinet agenda papers um, for our scrutiny items today. So our first item we'll be scrutinising is item six, the National Underground Assets Register. Um, officers, was there anything you wanted to add uh, in addition to the report before we move on, we move on to questions? Uh, yes, if I may, Chairs, uh, one small update. update. There is a uh... There is an error in the, in the report um, to do with in the risk management section. It says that we would be one of only two not to sign up. Um, there was some confusion with the uh, initial pilot work and the situation with this agreement is that 11 of the 22 councils have currently signed. 
So the national project is trying to get all councils signed up by March so that the project can proceed uh, in full from April next year. So that is 11 of the 22 councils have currently signed up. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And that is in relation to some questions we've got later. So I'm sure members appreciate that. Um, so the first member I'm going to bring in is um, uh, Cathy. Cathy. Thank you, Chair. Um, my first question um, is around the benefit of this for Neath Patalbert. So it would be helpful if you could give us some idea of the current sort of staff and time costs for providing this information on an ad hoc basis. Um, so we can look at the the advantage of actually having the information uh, provided centrally, because obviously, even though it would be available centrally on this register, that information will still need to be um, updated and checked every three months. So there will still be staff costs. Um, also, how much benefit Neath Patal but would get from the register? Obviously, it's it's great for contractors and developers. But is this information that we ourselves uh, would actually need to use frequently? Um, and finally, this is not a question that you'll be able to answer, but a point that I think needs to be considered. At the moment, this is funded through to 2024. The, in your report, um, it states that a decision will be made by the end of 2022 in terms of local authorities are going to be charged for using this service going forward. So I think that is something that possibly it would be useful to hold off on the decision until we know what that charge is going to be. And also if there's going to be a charge for contractors to use the register, because if they're going to have to pay to use the register, they can still go to the council, come to us to get the information for free, because I understand we are actually obliged to, to provide the information for, for free on request. So, uh, those are my uh, three points. So two questions and a, a point there. Thank Thanks. you, Councillor James. Um, Mike, did you want to respond? Yeah, in terms of current costs in the council, um, as is set out in the report, it, sections forever have, have, have dealt with their own assets and provided information when that's been been called on. Now we. We do not, we've never recorded exactly how much that is. So I can't tell you what those costs are. Uh, you're quite right that the cost to actually maintain the asset information will be the same in, in future as it is now. Um, potentially slightly a bit more onerous because we'll be putting information onto a third party platform, which people will be relying on. Um, uh, to, to dig in the ground and we may have not quite as much control in terms of how we caveat that information or that, that, that we provide. So um, the cost will be the same in terms of gathering the assets that we currently gather, um, but I cannot tell you because we don't currently record it how much officer time, for example, goes into responding to every request for undertaker information that we get. Um, in terms of business uh, benefits for the council, um, of course, we have two consultancies in the council, an architectural and um, an engineering consultancy. That will be a benefit for them when they can, when they're doing their designs, they can go straight to the one platform and get all the information. We also have um, uh, construction uh, work gangs within the council, both on the highway side and in building side, which also uh, at times goes into the highway and um, Another area, so so we there would be a benefit for our own in-house construction gangs as well to be able to access the information um, very easily in theory at, at, at a touch of a button. Of course, this does rely on everybody joining up and everybody putting their information in. So the success of the project as a whole relies on everybody taking part. I think on the face of it, it's it, it's a good idea, isn't it? It, it, it? Feel it is a good idea if you could go to somewhere. And, and all the information would be to hand, reliable information would be there and, and that people can um, uh, get to work in the ground very quickly by pulling all the undertaker information, whether that's BT, gas, water, us, whatever. Um, it, on the face of it, it's a good idea. 
the, 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 the reality will be how does that, that, that pan out, I think, between now and that sort of um, September 24 period when the, when the UK funding runs out, how far do we get and how does it work? Um, baby charge, yes. Um, we don't know the answer to that at the moment. Obviously, there, there is a cost. There is a cost to people to write in um, and to do statutory undertaker checks and to go to all the different. So there is a cost to that. If it was a modest cost that just helped support the platform, um, you know, I, I, I pick a figure of ten pounds or something. I don't. If it, but if it was a modest cost, that, you know, I'm sure people would use it. Um, if it was hundreds of pounds, yes, people would wonder what they're paying for. I think so. Um, it does depend on the cost if there is one, because they said there may there may be one. They haven't decided. So, but I but I but I take the point. Um, perhaps if half if if half half the bodies out there don't take part, perhaps it won't move forward um, after after March once they get get to a position. You know, if 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 let's say um, gas undertakers or electric don't take part in the scheme, then obviously its value would be much much diminished. Um, but I take the point. Yes, we we don't know if there's going to be a charge. They are reviewing whether it would be, if it was a very modest charge, as I say to re, to maintain the platform, probably okay. Okay, that was very helpful. Thank you. Thanks both. Um, I've got a uh, next question from Councillor Andrew Dacey in the chamber. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to ask who, the, who was the only other council that hasn't signed up for it, but obviously Zaf, the other councils haven't signed up for it now. Um, do you know the reasons why they haven't signed up for it? Or, and, and you've also mentioned the other services, are they all signed up to it? Otherwise, it's, it's going to be pointless if not everybody signed up for it. Yeah, well, I guess we won't know until the end of March when everyone's going through their processes. That, that That's when they're looking to have everybody in place, as I say, to, to kick off from next April. So, um, you know, uh, uh, everyone's got different processes. Some councils have actually, it's within the delegated authority of officers and they, this, it, they've signed up and that, that, that's happened. Um, other councils like us are going through processes, um, uh, their normal sort of decision-making processes with members. So they will all run at different times. So we won't know until everyone's um, uh, considered uh, reports like this have gone through the different organisations um, who signed up and who hasn't. OK, thank you. You happy with that, Andrew? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Excellent. Um, my next indication is Councillor Tim Bowen. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question, I think it's been uh, partially, partly answered. Um, on average, how long a contract is waiting for information now? I know it's going to vary from site to site, but uh, just on average. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't speak for other other parties that they get information from. Um, information in some areas is much, much better than others, and I'm sure it depends where you're going to look into dig as well, in terms of the historical record. Um, but I, I, I don't have that figure. I'm sorry. Uh, could I just add there, Mike, in terms of the consultancies, we tend to have to do them on a couple of occasions, so we're doubling our work. Um, you do it at the initial feasibility stage to see if you've got any uh, significant services that are going to be problematic at the beginning, but then it could be at least maybe 12 or 18 months by the time you complete the detailed design and then again before you go on to site uh, to actually do the physical construction we tend to have to check again in case something has changed in the interim so um, it can be quite time consuming um, particularly when you've got multiple service providers that we've got to check with they all come back at different times um, so, so we could end up waiting maybe a fortnight or three weeks for all responses to come back. So there is a delay factor um, involved in the process as well. I mean, if it's a licensed process, then we can access all data. We can do it immediately online in one hit. So, uh, you know, when you multiply that up across local authorities and contractors right across 
um, Wales and the UK. I mean, it must be, you know, significant savings overall in terms of manpower, um, uh, trying to retrieve that data. So, as Mike said, it is a good thing. Um, but as Councillor Dacey says, it, you know, it needs all parties to engage and sign up to it to maximise that efficiency and the benefits to all. Thanks. OK, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, um, thanks for those questions, members. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I guess sort of listening to the discussion, I think what, what one of the key points here that's been raised by by officers as well is, is around um, the success relies on everyone kind of taking part and taking part fully. And I suppose that that's probably the, the concern I've got, and I know other members have got around perhaps the partial level of engagement that we're proposing. We may not even realise that the benefits for our own in-house staff if we've only got some limited data sets on the system. But I think I can understand and members can understand perhaps why that's the current position. Um, I also appreciate, I suppose, there's a few unknowns around will the scheme go ahead after March, what the charges will be, whether the funding will will last. But I I, I do think there may be some merit here to, to, to bring in something back to the committee at a later stage. I, I, Councillor uh, Cathy James has, has popped her hand up. I don't know if you want to come in on this point, Cathy. Yeah, I think given the uncertainties, I think um, if the Cabinet Board is, is minded to go with option two, I think it would be useful to have in their provision for a review in 12 months time so we can assess how um, how much it has cost us, how much it's likely to cost in the future and how much benefit we are actually getting from the process and if the full engagement will actually be be beneficial at that point. So I think if uh, a 12 month review uh, of the process would be useful. OK, I've got two indications. Um, I, I can't actually read the officer's name from here. Al, Al Ed first um, and then uh, Mike can come in. Al Ed. Hi, Councillor Percy. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add what uh, David and Mike have said about the benefits and the costs. So um, there won't be any costs to the user. So anyone like the authority and contractors wishing to retrieve data from the platform won't be charged because it's legislated that um, that information has to be provided for free. So, so I'm not sure if there was um, if that was one of the questions, but so as a user, there won't be any charge um, because because um, th that charge is, is is we're not able to pass that cost on because we have to provide the information free of charge. Um, with regards to the benefits um, and the signing up from from meetings with the NUR team project team, um, they they are. Um, have confidence in in the um, platform being signed up by all the utility, all the main utility companies in in Wales and also um, authorities as well. So even though 11 of 22 have signed, uh, they believe that obviously by March next year that, that all authorities um, will be signed up. But obviously we won't know that um, officially until until that time. OK, thank you for that. And uh, Mike, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, I think probably when we when we when we're writing the report of the officers, of course, have no fear. We we would be right. We would be coming back if there was a problem. We would be coming back to you, uh, and we were probably thinking that way when the report was produced. So, in terms of a review, um, formalising that, if you like, I, I don't see a problem with that. I mean, I would have probably suggested twelve months from April because that would be 12 months of actually experience of operating the scheme, if that's when it's going to kick off properly. Um, and I guess that would be an 18 months rather than 12 months, but um, that would give us a full 12 months experience of actually operating the scheme. But um, obviously led by members in when you, you want to have that. No, thank you for that. I, I, I think that, that sounds sensible, um, if I'm honest. I think um, in terms of the scope of what maybe committee members would want to come back, you know, uh, Councillor Cathy James outlined some some of that information um, around perhaps how it's going presently. Uh, but I think it would be really helpful to perhaps flesh out 
um, some of the benefits to those internal teams that was discussed and what perhaps those benefits could be if we fully engaged, because I think that's perhaps the point I made earlier is if we only partially upload small bits of data to the to the scheme, then we can't actually achieve that sort of full efficiency uh, savings and 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 internally either. So I think if if a bit more information around that could be included when uh, a report comes back to the committee, I think that would be that would be very helpful. Alan, did you want to come back on that point? Yeah, um, just there's, there's two things about benefits. So the, there's there's benefits for external parties looking for information that Neath Patalbert hold. But I think the main benefit, and again, David tried to explain it, and I don't know whether I want to try and explain it a little bit more. The benefits is that at the moment, the authority undertakes numerous works um, out on um, that involves excavations. So the benefit to the authority is more to do with making sure that we are part of the NUR, but also that everyone else is as well. So that when we undertake searches, we don't have to undertake searches for all the individual utility companies. So if you look at the list in the report, everyone, including the authority, every time they've got a scheme that requires excavation, would have to do separate searches. So you would have to do a search for Welsh Water, you'd have to do a search for BT, you'd have to do a search for Virgin, you'd have to do a search um, for, um, I can't remember the other utilities listed in there, but, but that's, that's over, over five utilities on on their own. So, so, so the benefit is obvious from that point of view, because what you're doing is instead of having five separate searches, you have it in one location. Um, and, and I'll be honest here, I, I mean, I, I was hoping that that would be clear in, in the report, um, uh, that, that, that the obvious benefits from that point of view. So I just wanted to make that point. Yeah, absolutely. Perhaps I need to be a little, a little clearer, <laughs> kind of what I was saying, I suppose. I'm referring to the data sets that we currently hold as a council internally and the report acknowledges we've got a lot of information that perhaps isn't up to standard to be included on the system and that would require a lot of staff and resourcing and time to bring that information up to standard and also to, to keep that information up to date and I suppose there's a case to be made for the benefits for the authority having that information up to date and accurate internally as well as all the the external benefits you've mentioned. And I suppose I think that would be um, something that the committee would like to see when a report comes back, perhaps to flesh that out a little bit more as well. Um, so I don't know if I want to go to Councillor James now, just perhaps to, to maybe make a proposal on on um, on this, this um, review period. Yeah, that's fine. So if we suggest that we have a review of the decision in, what would it be, April 2024, with more information about the, the costs and benefits of the scheme and how we want to continue with it. OK, that's, that's brilliant. Um, can I get a seconder for that? A second. Oh, Councillor Dacey in the chamber. Thank you. Um, so if no members indicate to the contrary, then um, we'll be uh, proposing to add this as an addition to the recommendation um, that this decision is reviewed um, in 12 months from April um, 2023. Can I also just confirm no indications? Yeah, I don't see any indications against that. You may want a proposal in a second. Yeah. There we are. That's fine. Thank you. Thanks, members. Um, right. So we'll move on now to um, item 12, which is key performance indicators 2022-2023, um, quarter one. Um, do any officers want to add anything to the report before we go to questions from members? <laughs> yeah, I can't see any indications there. So. I'm going to go first to um, Councillor Tim Bowen on this item. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, there's three um, KPIs which uh, I'm rather concerned about, uh, which are showing very low. Um, I know we've had a pan pandemic and so forth, but um, food hygiene is the first one, inspection, uh, that's shown in red. Um, drinking water, the standards on that is still shown in red. 
And the other one is trading standards, which is still shown in red, and these are showing very low percentages. Um, could someone just give some clarification on that, please? Thanks, Tim. I'm not sure who wants to come in on that. Is that you, Kerry? Yeah, I'll, I'll come in, Chair. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bowen. Yeah, this, I mean, as I say, members will will be mindful that obviously with the pandemic, uh, the, the, the service, the Environmental Health and Training Standards Service was very much redeployed and reprioritised um, as a consequence of needing to respond uh, to, to, to the many challenges that came with the pandemic. And as a consequence, uh, a lot of the businesses, as, as, as usual, sort of uh, functions that the service undertook um, did have to be uh, sort of stood down effectively in, in, in many respects. So in terms of the first, um, uh, the food inspection uh, uh, issue, um, there are about, a, there are just over 1,400 um, food businesses in, in East Patalbot. Um, and what, as a consequence of, of those numbers, um, local authorities have worked with the Food Standards Agency to come, come up with what's called a, a recovery plan. Because I think there was there was a clear recognition that there was no way that sort of services from across authorities would be able to just kick back in in terms of uh, their requirements uh, to meet uh, and sort of score all those uh, food businesses. So um, a recovery plan was was put in place, which has been agreed with the, with the FSA, which essentially prioritises sort of new businesses and those within the sort of higher risk groups. So. Um, there are sort of thresholds uh, and, and and to to meet in terms of that uh, dealing with the backlog as as that progresses. So uh, we are currently on target to meet those uh, agreed uh, thresholds um, uh, going forward. Um, and again, those 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 deadlines that we're currently working to sort of meet and deliver uh, on on the new businesses, particularly those that have been set up during the pandemic, um, and indeed those within the higher risk groups. Um, in terms of uh, you know those food establishments that have been uh, have been sort of inspected and, and do meet um, hygiene standards, I, th I think that there's there's a target there that's actually been achieved. Uh, whereas uh, you know 96 96 and a half percent those that have been inspected have actually met the food standards. So we are very much on course in terms of uh, the recovery plan that's that's been agreed with the FSA. And and that issue, I, I should say, is not is not unique to to, to Neath Patel, but is it is um, a, a process and a recovery plans that have been set in place um, on a national basis. Um, in terms of uh, the, the the private water supplies, uh, again similar issues. Um, we you know risk assessments have commenced on all six private water supplies that that we have locally. Um, and the and, and I think the reality of it is these will be gradually completed over the course of of the reporting year. Um, the narrative uh, sort of sort of highlights there for members that to date sort of two have been sampled and have been failed and and as a consequence sort of remedial works enforcement work um, is underway. Um, one has confirmed that they no longer wish to trade following COVID, and one has been recorded as complete. So uh, we anticipate that the performance against that particular um uh sort of kpi will improve um, as the year as the quarters progress um again in terms of the trading standards um you know tr trading standards sort of cover and inspect and an, a sort of a wide variety of of, a, of of businesses um just a few examples that you know they inspect farms uh, in terms of small holdings and markets to ensure that animals are tagged and there's traceability uh, in terms of any animals that are entering the food chain um, they look at food standards in terms of sort of descriptions, composition, uh, labeling, sort of allergens um, and recalls. And they also look at sort of feed in terms of hygiene and standards in terms of uh, inspections and sampling of those. And again, you know, similar to uh, sort of the, the food businesses, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a sort of, um, a, a, sort of a, a threshold that's been put in place so that we can prioritize uh, those higher risk businesses. Um, as I said, a lot of the team were redirected as part of of the response to the pandemic. So we are only now sort of uh, looking to focus back on these inspections. And again, what we anticipate is that as the quarters progress this year, we will see sort of continued sort of improving trends um, in each of the three uh, KPIs that have been reported. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for that, Kerry.
Thank you. Um, my next indication is um, Laura. Thank you, Chair. I've just got a couple of questions around the waste KPIs. Um, so my first question is, um, does the reporting figures for the fly tipping include member reporting via telephone calls directly to officers or is it just online reporting? Um, also, the successful prosecutions figure is shown as one equal in 100%. Should that not relate to the number of reports and be a percentage based on the reporting figures? So um, it's currently shown as 245. Shouldn't the percentage be based off that figure? Um, and um, I feel like there should be a KPI around, so there's a KPI around fly tip and removal days. I feel like there should be one for excess and side waste. Um, I feel like the targets could be on investigating and removing of um, excess waste, usually because these are the ones that contain the food and the hygiene, uh, the hygiene products. And then my last one is on um, why is the dog fouling uh, figure so low? Um, why don't we have like a targets around this? Um, and why is it just shown as like a figure rather than a percentage? Thank you. Thanks. Is that um, Mikey picking those up? You're on mute, Mike. Yeah, the fly, the fly tippy one um, is same with all all contacts should officers should put all contacts uh, forward those copy those to our admin officers so they do get entered into either the service first system, whether it's, you know, mail contact or whatever. Now, um, that has not always been the case when when members of of um, emailed individual officers. So but we try and instill that discipline. Certainly, obviously, all the ones that go to the contact center, which is the which is the detail that we give out, we are that that goes straight in, no problem there. But there have been cases where, uh, and we found out when not when members, for example, haven't had a reply, uh, where things have slipped through the net, where it hasn't been put into the system, but it should be, uh, and we try and instill that that discipline. If can I tell you that everyone that's ever gone direct to an officer has been put in? I couldn't say that, but that's what should happen. Uh, and that's the discipline we try. And, uh, there was two more. But what was the second query? Sorry, that, um, that the um, the figure for successful prosecutions is showing as one, and then the percentage that is shown as a hundred percent. So it's classing the one as hundred percent. Should that not be related to the number of reports? So shouldn't the percentage be based off a different figure opposed to the singular figure itself? Okay. Well, I mean. Um, sometimes I, I'm not sure where the origin of some of these, but um, you know we can we can look at PIs and presenting information however you want it. Obviously, we, one of the information is when we actually do end up going to court with people, how successful are we? And in that case, there was one case that went to court and we were successful on it. And quite often cases don't go to court because people take up the, the um, fixed penalty notice option uh, and they sign and and and. So that route, so there is no, there is no um, uh, follow up in in the magistrate's court or anywhere else. So um, we can certainly look at look. At, you know, we we can provide we you know, provide members with information as they'd like they'd like to see it. Um, not sure it would give you a lot of benefit in terms of reports of dog fouling. Obviously, people write in things like dog fouling, and and we would um, respond to that as neighbourhood services. Um, actually having prosecutions as a percentage of, of, of customer contacts for things like that, I'm, I'm not sure it would give you a meaningful figure. Um, but certainly, you know, happy to look at whatever you'd like to receive as members in terms of performance information. In terms of excess waste, of course, all PIs have to have a sort of infrastructure around them to gather the data to do it. Um, and um, again for it to be meaningful you need to understand whether it's a sample data or whether it's sort of across the whole borough that we're looking at and how many rounds um, so we'd have to look at that and have to look at how we resource that um, again we can look at whatever you'd like but um, we'd have to take it away and have a look at it see how we resource it and see how we could give meaningful data um, okay. 
why is this the, the dog fouling um yeah the the um dog fouling enforcement of course is an area which was um hit quite severely by it's one of those areas that was hit severely by covid i know we're coming out of that you know we had periods where the sort of legal process was was almost at standstill we had we had a long period where we couldn't conduct any um police and criminal evidence act interviews so whether that was for fly tipping dog fowl or anything else so it was enforcement was an area which was was heavily affected both um both on the legal side and from officer interviews and from officers being redeployed to other areas now that is getting back to normal and it, and and i'm told the the prosecutions for fly tipping and things are now coming back through the system and now starting to happen regularly regularly again and you should see that reflected in the the pis that start start coming forward dog foul enforcement is some in particular is something that's really difficult because you either need to have a witness that's prepared to put their name to the to the um observation um which and, and quite often people will tell you who's who's responsible for letting their dog foul but they won't put their name to it publicly uh, and the other side of it is our, our enforcement officers actually have to witness it and of course when when they're seen um people start clearing up after their dogs or or put them on a lead or, or whatever so um it's not easy to actually catch catch people in the act of not clearing up after their dogs um and that's why we tend to have these sort of whole team exercises where we sort of deploy the whole team to an area um uh, to try and sort of maximize our opportunity to find find somebody and also to make it clear then so one is we try and look um uh, sort of from a distance but then we make ourselves visible to make it clear that people, you know we are out there enforcing but it's it's quite difficult to do dog fouling enforcement okay Should come back? can i just yeah come back? You can... um so the when you say they de deploy to an area like how is that area highlighted that's what makes them like a hot spot for the team to go out to like, how do you choose the specific areas? Uh, well, one of the ones is obviously members write right into the team. Um, members write in about the problem areas that they've got. That that's that's uh, uh, one way I, I I've regularly seen over the last few years how which which initiate whole team exercises. Obviously, the more um, customer contacts that 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 neighbourhood services get about dog fouling reports from that, they can they know where the hotter spots are okay thank you i'm i'm gonna move on to some other members so that's okay laura um i've got Roz down next to ask a question and then i'll bring in comes around to jc i can't even remember what the question was now uh, sean was it regarding I, I can come back to you that's all right that's fine Roz. i i don't think i'm mid and off myself um no, I didn't make a note of it, Roz, I'm afraid. I'll, I'll go to Councillor Daisy if you want. Yeah. Andrew? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think we do, if we do get notifications of the positive fixed penalties and prosecutions, and then we can feed that back to our residents to show that we are doing something about flight tipping, about dog fouling, about, and about whatever other antisocial behaviour we got. And on the, the dog fowl in Aberavon Beach is particularly bad. If you're running along a prom, I don't run anymore. I was like Shane Williams running along a prom one thing, sidestepping on the dog fowl in there. So that's another area that needs to be looked at. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. That's, I guess, more around communication of, of some of these things. Did you have anything to add to that, Mike? No, just as, as um, members who've been around a while would have known before COVID, of course, for a number of years, we were the we were the um, we had mo more prosecutions for fly tipping than any other council in Wales. So it was something we were set up to do and something we were actively involved in. But as I, I've said, I do recognise it is an area that was um, particularly affected by the COVID pandemic period. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll give you a break for a few minutes now because I've got a, a question on um, a plan in performance indicator. So um, perhaps this one's for Kerry. Um, this is PI 579 around um, 
yeah, performance and plan department. I just wondered if there was an update really on the issues around the, the sort of staffing levels and capacity. I think the commentary in, in the report suggests we're still looking to recruit. Um, so just looking for an update really. This is something that's been an issue for a little while, isn't it? Yeah, thanks. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it, the situation is improving, albeit we're still not up to sort of full complement. I think perhaps for the benefit of, of, of other members on the call, uh, again, possibly as as, a, as an indirect consequence of of the uh, of the pandemic, you know, o over a period of time, we have lost quite a lot of experience and knowledge from certainly the development management team. Um, as I said, a, a lot of sort of officers have sort of reassessed their personal circumstances, and and some have retired, some have moved on to other opportunities. But we have gone through quite a, an unprecedented sort of period of of. Um, change in terms of um, uh, officers that we have um, available and at our disposal. But we have we have been going through um, an extended period of recruitment. We've been very successful, to be to be honest, and we've been quite fortunate in 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 uh, sort of appointing some of the, some of some of the officers that we have. But as I said, we're still not quite up to full um, capacity. Uh, we still have, um, for example, one of the senior. Uh, officer posts that we have in the structure is still vacant, so um, it seems to be a challenge, n not just within planning. I think I think um, colleagues on the call, and indeed corporately, I think uh, do do recognise that there there is an ongoing challenge at the moment, particularly recruiting uh, the senior officers and above. Um, and indeed, once once we get people um, uh, in post, actually retaining the you know that 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 expertise and knowledge. So it's it's an ongoing challenge that we have, but um, I think things are steadily improving, um, which is starting to show show now in 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 the performance that we've got against against these targets. I think I think although we've we've slightly missed, we're slightly under target in terms of the um, uh, percentage of all sort of planning applications determined in time. There has been a significant improvement from uh, certainly quarter four of last last reporting year. So hopefully um, we we'll. And we'll continue to see that trend going forward. Um, I, I should also say that, you know, at, at a time where we have seen um, a, a lot of change in terms of the personnel we have available, uh, you know, the team has also been dealing with quite an unprecedented levels of interest within within East Coast, but particularly for the larger major uh, applications and schemes that are coming forward. So, um, you know, the team are very much working hard, uh, you know, to work through um, that that workload, um, and, and I think we're starting now to see the benefit of of the additional staff that we do have in post. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Kerry. J just a, a specific follow up question in terms of current vacant posts. You mentioned there's a senior post vacant. Are there any other posts vacant in the teams at the moment? Uh, yeah, we do have one planning uh, assistant post uh, vacant, which uh, which we're going through the recruitment process as uh, at the moment. But what may Result as a consequence of that is is a is an internal movement of staff, which will then um, perhaps move 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 the problem elsewhere. So so we might need to uh, continue with the recruitment. So we we've uh, from from member I can double check, but I think we've currently got two vacant posts um, available in the structure, one senior and one at a, a, an assistant level. Excellent, thank you, Kerry. Um, did any other members want to come in before I sum up some of the the changes to KPIs? Because I've got a, a couple of suggestions around changes to some of the indicators as well and I've made some notes from other members. Um, Councillor Freegard, Sharon. Oh thank you Chair. I just wanted to ask Mike how many dedicated officers have we got for dog fouling specifically? Sorry uh, none. We've got no no we've got no enforcement officers dedicated to anything in particular. Right. They all so, do that. They all do a range. So how how do they patrol, you know, the dog fouling? Like I don't see anybody down the beach anymore. And we've had particular problems around the schools in my area. Um, I mean, the teams are great at cleaning it up. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just wondering about how we patrol those areas. Not at all or well, seldomly. Obviously, the team, the team is there and out there. I, I, I can't. I've got the detail with me this morning on, on, okay. on what they're doing. Sorry. OK. Could we have some more detail on that, perhaps in the next six weeks or something? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I'm sure they could come up with a schedule of activity. 
that they've been doing. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, if you'd be happy to circulate that, Mike, I'm sure the committee would appreciate that. Um, OK, I can't see any other indication at the moment, so I'm just going to run through some of the um, KPI changes that have been suggested. Um, so Laura mentioned, um, um, which was, where are we now? Um, was it fly tipping reports you mentioned, Laura, in yours? And re that result in prosecution. I think that was one suggestion that you came yeah. up with, wasn't it? So I'll, I'll I'll run I'll run through the list. So I think, um, in terms of the the KPI around missed collections, um, at the moment that's that's just given us a raw figure of the number of missed collections for refuse and recycling. Um, I, I I think that would be much more helpful if that was expressed as a percentage of the total number of collections and that it, a target is set on it at the moment we're just given a figure and there's no there's no target and and therefore no red amber green status on it either so um i, I appreciate the discussion around setting a target might be um <laughs> a bit of a tricky one um but I, but i think it'd be really helpful for us as a committee in terms of tracking that particular issue around miscollections if that was expressed as a percentage and, and a target was set um likewise there's been a bit of a discussion around waste enforcement and the difference between prosecutions and fixed penalties, um, but the performance indicator for that combines the two. Um, I think it would be helpful to have those separate. So waste enforcement prosecutions and fixed penalty notices, if we were just having that data separate, I think that would be helpful um, for the committee as well. So they, they sort of up, updated KPIs. In terms of new um, performance indicators, um, around missed collections, I think it would be very helpful for um, um, to, for us to have the information on the percentage of missed collections that are actually returned to and collected. It's a really big issue for most members in terms of people reporting a missed collection and then what happens afterwards. Um, so, you know, if officers can look at the feasibility of gathering that data, um, that will be really helpful as well. Um, the I think a member mentioned this, I forget if it was Laura, around the number of days to collect excess and side waste. Um, because the, the figure is given around the number of days to clear flight tip in. Um, I think that would that would be very helpful as well. Um, and then just repeating the first one, which was the percentage of flight tipping reports which result in prosecution. Mike, I think you did mention you didn't feel that would be helpful. I think it would be helpful. Um, I think that would be a really good way to track the prosecution rate, um, which I just think is a little bit more helpful than um, the headline figures are quite good on prosecutions, but understanding actually if we've got a lot more flight tipping, um, we'll have more prosecutions. So I think the the rate would be quite helpful for us to understand. I'm sure um, committee services can kind of circulate the details of these to officers for for, for consideration and feedback. Um, did um, did any officers want to want to make any comments on those um, suggested changes to KPIs? Um, I just obviously we can we if if that is circulated we can consider it. I would, I mean, miss collections. If you if you divide seven seven hundred and fifty by three million or whatever, is that really going to give you something meaningful? Um, I would say one thing, uh, and also setting targets. On what basis would we set a target for a miss collection? I think if we brought to members before, if the roads dug up and the the, the crews can't get there. Um, if it's parked cars and the crews can't get there, there are lots of reasons for potential miscollections. And I, I do wonder on what basis we we would set a target. I mean, it's a it's a measure, and you would see the trend in in a in a measure in a number. So I could understand, you know. So that's where I think a number is quite good because you can see a number and you can track a number and you can see a trend in it. Percentage is going to give you a a very small little number. And I'm not sure how setting a target would, how we would set a target other than we'd like to improve. It would be a sort of aspirational figure. There'd be no basis on which to say we want it to be 50% less or 20% or less. Or um, So I do wonder about the benefit of that. And, and well, I, 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 suspect, I, I, I suspect I suspect we'd be wasting all our time, frankly, but um, uh, but that's not to say, you know, that you, that, you know, that's why we're providing the mis the mystery. But there are lots of reasons for for miscollections, not just 
that the crew didn't see a bin and pick it up. Absolutely, I think I, I I think I accept that, and the, and the, the committee accept that as well. I, I suppose if you look at all of the performance indicators in in the report, there's lots of reasons as to why, um, and and underneath all of that data as to why um, perhaps things haven't made their targets. I just I do think, and I think the committee feels it's very important that there are targets on some of these things. You, you've touched on performance and perhaps an aspiration to improve performance, and I think that's probably the crux of the issue. Um, I think if if there is a target. And th th there's there's a there's at least a, a drive to improve a performance in that area. And in terms of just the presentation of the data, um, a percentage might be a small number, but from a data point of view, it is it is more helpful um, to understand that. So I, I I I'd be quite firm, I suppose, on on those points. I think they are quite important for us to track. And and of course, then we can have a discussion around the reasons behind um, the performance and the reasons behind. Um, you know wh wh whether a target is 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 missed or not. You know in in this forum, but I think we perhaps need um, that extra information to really delve into some of these um, issues. Um, did any of the committee members have anything to add on sort of the KPI points of view? Um, Councillor Grimshaw, Steph. Hi, I just wanted to um, support the chair on this. It is um, quite a, a big issue and I understand there are going to be lots of reasons, um, but there are lots of reasons for, you know, all the other KPIs. And I just wanted to offer my support behind what um, Councillor Percy was saying. OK, thank you for that, Steph. Uh, Chair, what I'll do is, obviously this report is for noting which members will do shortly, um, but what I can do is speak with the officers outside the meeting and maybe Sean Davis, who is the officer for the performance and the KPIs, um, and make arrangements going forward and, and uh, just organise potentially how we can make those changes going forward if that's something that, that can be done. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, so with no further indications then, um, as... Um, as has just been stated, the reports for monitoring, therefore, um, the committee notes uh, the report. So if I take people back now to the scrutiny agenda um, and to agenda item four, which is the action log. Um, again, this is for noting. Um, there's some items on there now. This is a sort of a new thing, uh, this council term, which is really helpful just for us to keep track of these asks that we've, we, we're making in committees. Um, so there's a few items on there that have come up from previous meetings and members um, are able to ask for updates, I suppose, on those items. But I, I don't believe we've got any any queries on them today, uh, but just to draw your attention to that. Um, and then in terms of the scrutiny agenda and urgent items, I don't have any urgent items. Um, no, Chair, I haven't been notified of any. There we are. Excellent. So there are no further items on the agenda. So that ends um, business today. Uh, deal. Thank you. If I can just come in but just prior to closing yeah. the meeting, sorry. If I can just remind those officers just to join the cabinet board team's invitation and any relevant office uh, members, sorry, um, and just give us um, about five minutes just to set up for the relevant uh, cabinet board. That will be coming up shortly. Thanks, Chair. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, deal, everyone.